Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Talks at Google virtual event. My name is Ricardo Orna, and I work on our Google recruiting team, and I'm so excited to be here today. Now, before we get started, I want to remind the audience that we will be taking questions towards the end of the talk. I know y'all are going to have a ton. So as you think of them throughout the conversation, make sure to add them to the chat on the right. And now I am so stoked to introduce today's guest, of who I'm a huge fan, the one and only Todrick Hall. He's here to discuss his fourth studio album and most personal album to date, Femulin, which has him starring and sharing the spotlight with some of the biggest names, including Nicole Scherzinger, Chaka Khan, Tyra Banks, and Brandy. Now, for those of you that don't know, Todrick has worked with everyone from Taylor Swift to Beyonce to Pentatonix, going from national fame on American Idol to international fame via Drag Race to even greater global fame through a cavalcade of viral videos that pushed him to over half a billion YouTube channel views, which is huge. In addition to that, he's had Broadway runs in Kinky Boots, Chicago and Waitress, and was a dance captain on the BBC's Greatest Dancer. He has millions of streams across multiple visual albums and EPs, his own MTV show, and a 60-date solo tour spanning the US, Europe, Asia, New Zealand, and Australia. Y'all, there are double threats, there are triple threats, and then there's Todrick Hall, rapper, singer, songwriter, actor, dancer, director, choreographer, and hopefully a close friend in the future. <laughs> so with that, Todrick, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our talks at Google. Ricardo! <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm so good after I heard that note. Oh, that was so high. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my gosh. First of all, that might be the best introduction I've ever had. You just made me feel like I was the Beyonce of the gay community. So thank you <laughs> for that. Of course. No, I'm feeding off of your energy. I'm so excited to be here today. It's like a pleasure and a privilege. I think I told you this when we ch first chatted. I'm glad I got the fangirling out of the way. Well, most of it, some of it might still come out. Um, but I'm excited to have this conversation with you. It's actually been a dream of mine to have a conversation with you for years. So it's happening now. This is real and I love it. Um, and I'm stoked. So thank you. Well, I think it's now my chance to fangirl because when I spoke to you on the phone, I did not realize how handsome you were. So <laughs> no. congratulations on your face, Ricardo. <laughs> like, you are the only like Prince Ali doppelganger. You look just like Aladdin. And I'm down to take the magic carpet ride if you want, but we'll pause that for a little <laughs> Thank you so but, much. To the yeah, you're so <laughs> handsome. Look at that face. Thank congratulations you. on your face, Ricardo. <laughs> thank you to my parents and thank you to the the editing team that's going to take out the blushing when we edit the video because that is real <laughs> right now. Um, Todrick, before we get started, I, you know, I typically ask folks how they're doing. I want to really know how you're doing because there's a lot going on in the world, some not so great things. You've got great things in your world, an album, a tour coming up, so many projects that we're probably going to hear about. So how are you really? How's your heart? How's your week? Thank you for asking that. Um, I'm actually great right now. I think that it's really difficult to be an artist right now in this time because everything is so touchy and people are very um i don't i don't i don't, I don't want to say ready to cancel because that's not i don't necessarily think that's the case but i just think that people are super hyper aware of being respectful of people who are minorities or uh, being aware of people that you know like trying to add inclusivity and diversity so i think it's a great thing but it's it's a strange time to be in the industry because um, I'm getting a lot of opportunities, but in some ways I feel like people are oftentimes casting me to check a box. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know what that's doing to my mental health. I'll probably have to check back in with you later to tell you that, but mm -hmm. I'm really grateful to be out performing again. The pandemic was so hard for so many artists because I think mm -hmm. being on stage was something we took for granted. Mm -hmm. And now I never thought there'd be a time where I couldn't get on a stage and perform. And there'd be days where I'd be like, oh, I really don't want to do this show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now after having to sit down for a year and a half and not perform, it just feels so great to be able to be out doing what it is I love and what I feel I was created to do. Ah, oh, yes. Well, thank you for your transparency and your candor. I know that it's been a tough time for everyone, to our viewers. We, we're with you. We know it, it's really rough. And I love uh, your, your honesty about, as an artist, how it's been difficult. And you know, we'll talk about mental health. We'll talk about what it's like to be a performer in, in this age and you know some of the challenges that come with that. But I just appreciate you being so honest. I'd expect nothing less. You are so authentic. And that's one of my favorite things about you. And I'm so excited to see that throughout the conversation. Um, you know, I got I to gotta start with the beginning, Todrick. I want to know 
Todrick in the early year or the earlier years. I feel like you're still in your early years. I'm not going to say you're you're right. still in the early years. I don't even know. I probably need my mom to sign a consent form because <laughs> I'm so young. Yes, you are. So let's go back to the earliest years. I want to hear a little bit about young Todrick in in Texas, from where Beyonce's from. What was it like growing up there? What was your childhood like? Um, it's so insane because when I look back on my childhood, I feel like there's a world where I could feel sorry for myself and sad, but I think ignorance is bliss. And I grew up in a world where I was just completely okay with being a sheep and following along with society and what society wanted me to do. But I always knew that I was very, very different. Mm -hmm. And I came out at a very, very early age. And that is when, when I got a huge wake up call because a lot of the people who were there for me before, when they just thought I was an artistic straight guy, who loved ballet mm -hmm. were um, were not there for me anymore in the same way that they were before. And I think it had a strain on my family, the relationship with my mom, my dad, when I came out. Um, mm -hmm. But in my earlier years, I just loved theater. I, I was introduced to theater and music and um, dance by an elementary school teacher who tested me for the gifted and talented program. And, mm -hmm. and Everything that I do, I always thank her because she opened my eyes and my brain and my mind and my imagination and unlocked this part of me that I think I've never lost touch with. No matter what happens in the industry, I always still remember that young boy who fell in love with The Wizard of Oz and fairy tales and ballet and going to see The Nutcracker. And it was everything about being in the, the world of theater, like walking into the room and like smelling the concession stand and like hearing the orchestra warm up to watching the curtain open and smelling the fog machine and all of that stuff is just so like ingrained in my memory is like such a great nostalgic like um, amazing euphoric feeling that i have when i'm in the theater so that's the part that is great that i remember um but the part of, of, of being a black kid who was a boy with with like tw raised with 12 other boys in my family that all were doing sports and all dating women and not feeling like I fit in there. That part was very difficult. And I always felt super uncomfortable going to the barber shop and getting my hair cut. And cause that the, it was the, the, the excessive masculinity in the barber shop was really, really difficult for me to feel like I could find my way or to have a voice. Mm. And so that was really, really rough with, for me. And I, I thought for a moment I was going to end up being somebody who was super introverted and shy and mm. afraid to chase my dreams. But fortunately, that did not happen. Yes, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you shared that. So much of what you said just struck a chord with me. Um, a queer person of color, growing up in a place where I didn't think I'd be accepted. I love musical theater. I also got tapped to do gifted. I'm not, I'm trying to humble myself a little bit, but fourth grade, I was like, okay. And that teacher is the one that changed my life and that gave me a voice and, and made me feel like I could do things. So I think your story is beautiful because a lot of of your fans, I'm sure resonate with that, with being in, in a place where you don't feel yourself. But then when you tap into who you really are, that's when the magic happens. And I, I love that you were able to find that. Um, I know for me, I think that you are a uh, representation for so many people. And I think that's beautiful that nowadays we do have that representation in many ways. We've got a long way to go, uh, but we see it. Um, yeah. But back then, and I know not way back then, because you're not way back then. Just <laughs> recently back then, yeah. <laughs> recently back then when you were a kid, when we didn't have queer people of color out there, um, you know, leading the charge. Who did you see as inspirations? Who are your role models? I was honestly inspired by a lot of like the amazing R&B divas that came before us. I mean, Brandy was a huge inspiration to me watching her play Cinderella alongside Whitney Houston. That movie changed my life. It really did. And when I when I hang out with Brandy now, which is very insane to say that she's a close friend of mine. Um, mm -hmm and a mentor and yeah, she's just an incredible human being to be around her and to soak up her energy because Brandy has gone through so much and endured so much more than a lot of people would in a lifetime on top of the fact that like she's been in this industry. She just experienced things that a lot of people wouldn't be able to bounce back from and mm -hmm. she's opened her eyes. But when I was a kid, I didn't realize how much diversity and representation mattered. And mm -hmm. I, I now realize why I gravitated towards that movie so much. And it was because I'd never seen a black woman be the the idealistic uh like like personification of beauty. Mm -hmm. Back 
that everybody in the ball wanted to be with her, the fact that the prince chose her out of everyone and the fact that she was the princess was life changing. And I've heard stories of behind the scenes and that they wanted Leanne Rhymes to play that role or mm -hmm. someone else. And, and, and while it would have been, you know, I, I'm sure Leanne Rhymes would have killed it or, and been great. It, it just, it, it, it inspired an entire generation. That one made for TV movie, by the way, mm -hmm. it never went to theaters, it never got some crazy like promotional budget or anything. It came on ABC a couple of times and it changed everyone's life um, because it made us feel like there was a place for us in these fairy tales because mm -hmm. I love Disney, but there mm -hmm. I never saw myself. The fact that Disney made Beauty and the Beast and, Little Mermaid, Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, Cinderella, all of these movies and no black people were in them at all, not yeah. even in the background, just shows th w where the world was then and where it's coming to now. So I think that that was one of my, my huge inspirations growing up was Brandy because she was just like America's sweetheart, but she was unapologetically like R&B and urban and black and sang gospel and had like a really, like her sense of humor, the, everything about her, her essence, the way she even performed in Cinderella um, was not, you know, her trying to pretend to be a white blonde haired, blue eyed Cinderella. She sang like Brandy. And so it was, it was just that, that was life changing. So I would say yeah. it was my inspiration. Oh, I love that. And it's cool because I think from from that perspective, like you said, you saw uh, a woman of color, specifically a black woman playing the lead role, which is beautiful. And even then, um, me being uh, around the same, t a kid around the same time that you were a kid, yeah. seeing LGBTQ people on camera um, in a role that wasn't comical or humorous was hard to find, right? And I never thought I'd be like- I don't even know if it honestly existed. I'm sure maybe somewhere in indie film, but um, not in mainstream media, no at all and it's almost like we kind of have to make do right like this is what we're given and hopefully somewhere in the back of our heads we're like we're going to be the ones that are going to pave the way and, and you've done that in so many ways but um you did what you had to do and i think you found an amazing source of inspiration i love her i think she's wonderful mm -hmm. um but very quickly talking about school obviously you said gifted so you probably were great in school you were in ballet you were in dance you did a lot of things <laughs> I wasn't really great in school. I have to, I don't even want all my teachers that I grew up with to be like, wow, he really let that slide. I was terrible in school, Ricardo. And I think it's because I always knew I was destined to do something else, mm -hmm. something different. And I was like, I don't need to know geometry. I don't yeah. need to know uh, algebra. I don't need to know the circumference yeah. e equals MC squared. I don't need to know that. Like, whatever. Um, so I think that that I was, I was okay with just yeah. like being a 70 and just like passing. Yeah. I was never a person that was trying to like get on the honor roll or like yeah. graduate with honors or anything because I just knew I wanted to sing and dance. And once I realized that Broadway was an option for me, I knew yeah. that that was meant to be. So I didn't really, I, I went to school and did the bare minimum of what I had to do to be able to, you know, you have to pass to play. So I was a cheerleader in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I did musical theater. I did one musical senior year. I was like, I, I'm too cool <laughs> for the theater. Like they, they can't handle me. Um, mm -hmm. I was also cast as a black Nazi in Sound of Music, which is insane that that even wow. allowed to happen, um, but it did. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but in high school, I, um, my junior year in high school, I decided to mount my own production of The Wizard of Oz. And the, the teachers at that school were not having it. And they went through so many links and hoops and hurdles to stop my production from happening. Uh, they called Tams Whitmark, who owned the rights, the licensing rights to Wizard of Oz. And long story short, they sent me a cease and desist letter and told me I had to cancel my show. Oh. And 16 year old Todrick was devastated. But mm -hmm. this is a true testament to the person that I am now. Like, yeah. I found way and I googled on my dial-up internet um, how I could find a loophole and I found out that all of L. Frank Baum's stories that he wrote all of the Wizard of Oz stories were now in public domain mm -hmm. so I had to change the slippers from Ruby to silver and like change a couple <laughs> of things but I wrote an entire musical and I ended up mounting that production of the Wizard of Oz which was so fun because it was yes. current and hip and all the music sounded like songs that could have been on the radio and it was so much fun mm -hmm. and to this day, that teacher still shows up to my shows on mm -hmm. Broadway, profusely apologizes and like, I'm so mm -hmm. sorry. I never, <laughs> if I had known you were going to be this person, I wouldn't have tried to stop you from doing it then. Mm -hmm. And we laugh about it now, but I thank that teacher. Yep. She was being a hater. Mm -hmm. I thank her because without that, I would not have started exercising and yep. as 
young age my ability to write music and to direct mm -hmm. and to choreograph um and she she brought out something in me that i might not have tapped into at such a young age had she not given me this huge what seemed like an impossible hurdle to jump oh, i love that you knew what you wanted i think that's great you know people are great at school and they go to college and that's their path for other folks i think i heard what's it called the uh, c's get degrees you do enough you do what you got to do we always had those yeah. teachers that were like you're not going to be carrying a calculator uh you know in your pocket and it's like well we are we we all carry calculators in our pockets we don't need to memorize those things i mean of course i yeah. i have a ton of friends that are that are academics and i love that but i wanted to talk to you a little bit about that i think i remember hearing an interview with you where you were chatting about your decision after high school, whether you're going to go to college or not. Like, you can feel free to correct me. It's been a while since I saw this interview, but I think I remember you saying something like you were going to an audition. If you got the audition, you would you would go for the role. And if not, you'd go to college. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that decision. I was a teacher for a while. I think education is so important, but why is it important to give students another option outside of going straight to college when, when they're done with high school? I think the world is just changing and college is not for everyone. I think that I had spent so much time in middle school, high school, elementary school. I started taking ballet when I was eight and I felt like, and I sang in church every single week and I was a cheerleader and my, my dad actually was a basketball coach. My stepdad um, taught me how to tumble and do backflips, which is so crazy that he's the one that taught me how to do that. Um, but I think that I had, done all of the things that I would have learned in college, I had learned from my personal life experiences. And mm -hmm. I think it's important for people to know if, it, if college is necessary for you, but I don't like the societal like pressure to go mm -hmm. from high school to college and get a degree because oftentimes for you to ask someone who's 17 or 18 to know what it is they want a degree in mm -hmm. and to know who it is that they want to be as an adult is like preposterous. Now right. as somebody who is past the age of 18. <laughs> I just think it's a ridiculous question and a ridiculous amount of pressure to put on somebody who's just now figuring out who they are um, to ask them what it is that they want to do for the rest of their life and to go to college and to sign up to get all of these insane college loans and to go into this massive amount of debt when you don't know what it is that you want to be. Um, but it, it's something that a lot of people feel pressured to do. And I, I strongly suggest that people make their own decision when it comes to that, because mm -hmm. you don't need to go to college for a lot of things in this world to be able to be overly qualified. And I also think that there's a lot of extra, you know, like, you know, decorative classes that you have to take in order to get a degree instead of mm -hmm. focusing on the on really, really mastering the things that you ha absolutely have to know to do that job with excellence. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes people get degrees and things and they don't really know that much about it. They just learned enough to pass the test, to be able to get a great, to, to insert the information for a moment and then delete it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So we have all these people out here that are, you know, have degrees and a piece of paper that they've mm -hmm. spent too much money for um, mm -hmm. so that they can do something that they might not even be able to do that well and yeah. might not be able to do as well as someone who doesn't have a degree but such as the world we live in um i think we i am very much so a fan of making your own rules and not feeling um pressured to do things that you don't want to do so if mm -hmm. there's anybody out there in the middle of this decision right now um do what you think you need to do a lot of people need to go to college because they mm -hmm. do need to and, and also college is an experience that shapes people you know the way they are i had i had such a great high school experience even though i was bullied constantly but mm. i got around sophomore year i got to a place where i just didn't really care and i took that power away from people calling me gay because i was so proud to be gay already by sophomore year that mm. no more fun and people making fun of me i owned who i was and i wore it with a badge of honor and i'm so proud of being gay like i never understood that you know you say gay pride gay pride gay pride so much to the point where you forget that what that actually means and this past year i was sitting with a group of friends and i was like i'm just so happy that i'm gay because i just think gay people are so awesome and mm -hmm. so fabulous and so just dope and creative and and resourceful and i mean i don't hardly know any gay people who mm -hmm. don't have great fashion sense who can't decorate a house to down you know like they mm -hmm. can't sing or dance or act of, we're just such creative like unicorn species and mm. um, and i just i love the fact that i'm gay i'm so happy that i'm gay and i'm very proud mm. of the fact that i was born gay and I, I never thought i would say that sentence and actually like mean it but this year mm. i said it for the first time and i was like oh that feels so nice to say you know 
after mm -hmm. living your life in this country for so long with so many people having stigmas about our, our community. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And that's, that's something that you don't necessarily learn in college. There's no, there's, you can learn about LGBTQ plus history, but to learn to truly love yourself is something that you can go anywhere. That's <laughs> oh, I love it. I love what you just said. We know, you know, as a community, we're not a monolith. I know that I come with a great deal of privilege to be at a place where I can say that I love my identity and embrace my identity. I know that not everyone's at that place yet. And you know, I think the goal is to get everyone there, but when we see folks loving themselves and embracing themselves and their identity, I think that's so powerful. And for someone like you to be able to weave that into your work and your art and using that platform to spread that message is beautiful. And so I wish young Ricardo and young everyone in the audience could, could hear a little bit of this back in the day, because um, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Todrick, I wanna talk about your childhood so much more, but I know we gotta move on. We gotta talk about your album. We gotta talk about some big things. Okay, um, let's do it. <laughs> but just to connect the two from, from little Todrick to where you are today, you've had a ton of experiences in between, I'm sure very formative experiences. Um, one of the biggest ones, of course, American Idol season nine, made it to the semifinals, mm -hmm. um, watched your audition multiple times because that's phenomenal okay. that you auditioned with that song. And I, I don't wanna spend too much time because y'all the videos are out there. He killed it. I don't care what the judges said. He absolutely <laughs> killed every single rendition. Um, but yeah, I just, I'd be curious to know, um, specifically when, when you were eliminated, I'm just going to be completely real. You know, a lot of folks can see something like that as a failure. You didn't make it. You weren't good enough, whatever. Um, the way that I see it, you use that to your advantage and that experience probably played a role in where you are today. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you felt immediately after you were, you were cut from the competition and how you think that experience shaped, um, who you are as an artist today? I think that when you're eliminated from a show like that, it's a lot goes through your mind. I remember if I'm being completely honest, which I think is the theme of the day. <laughs> I remember watching the movie, um, the Jackson five movie. Uh -huh. yeah, we would watch that movie all the time. My mom would never let me watch anything that wasn't rated G unless it was like the Malcolm X movie or, or what's love got to do with it or something that was based in a true story that was about somebody who was historically like a, a, a huge public figure in the black community. And in that um, movie, I remember very vividly, I haven't thought about this since that moment, but, um, and no one's ever asked me this question before. <laughs> I have a good question, Ricardo. But <laughs> I remember watching that scene where the, the Jackson Five, they lose to someone white who is far less talented and I remember Michael Jackson's like, can we keep the TV? Because they was like, they want like a, a TV. And he's like, um, Joe Jackson is like, forget that TV. We don't want it. And I remember thinking that like, when I got on Broadway for the first time, somebody in the dressing room told me as an African-American artist in this um, industry, you will have to sing higher. You will have to riff more. You will have to be able to do back flips and front flips and tumble and all of these things to be in the room. And the people who are across from you that are that don't look like you might not have to do those same things mm -hmm. to get the same thing or to be able to make more money than you and make it further in life. They won't have to have those same skill sets. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking that's an awfully pessimistic point of view. But as I grew up and got older, so many things that I experienced personally verified that for me. Yeah. I felt like on American Idol, I was judged on a different level. I felt yeah. like even on my worst days, I was to be completely honest, like out performing, out singing. My natural gift was just, I feel like, I don't know. It would, it would, there, it, to me, I wasn't being judged on the same playing field. And I watched season after season of American Idol and I realized that they would have, you know, 10 people in the top and two of them would be black always. And in that moment, I realized like, I'm, this is not a singing competition. I am playing a character and my character is not being presented to America as somebody that they want to put on this tour. And there is absolutely nothing I could sing and nothing I could do, I felt in that moment that would make me be that character because they've already chosen who they want their black guy and black girl mm. to this season of this show. Mm -hmm. And that's no shade to the people that were there. They were casting the show and that was fully appropriate at that time. I feel like if the show were to come back now, yeah. it would be different, but it makes me sad when I see like people who don't understand that concept, really talented black people who have had to walk away from that show to, 
to let other people who are less talented, but were more, I guess, digestible to middle America um, go, go forward and they get these huge record deals and they get all these TV opportunities and reality show op opportunities. And some of the greatest women that have been on that show, my, my girl, Vontel Solomon, Saisha mm -hmm. Mercado, who's going through something really tragic right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, like uh, there, Paris Bennett and like Keisha Jones, and um, there have just been so many girls on that show. Latoya uh, London mm -hmm. and uh, even Jennifer Hudson was just taken off that show so early. And I don't know that those votes are ever really real, but I just, mm -hmm. you know, I want to send out love to anybody who is African American who's been on one of those shows that got voted off and really believed that that was where their talent lied. Because I don't think that's the case. I think that a lot of those shows have been slightly shifted and rigged and whatever in order to um, put the people forward that they want, that they think that Middle America will like and support. That's my real opinion about yeah. what happened show and when i walked away from there i felt so defeated and i felt like i was in the twilight zone because i saw people that i didn't think were as, as talented mm -hmm. weren't bringing as much to the table get rave reviews and those rave reviews like swayed people at home to think mm -hmm. you know I, I remember people in the show thinking i was super talented i was going to make it far and me and another guy named jermaine sellers were getting these really insane reviews and I'm like if that guy opened his mouth and did what we did they would he'd win the show you know yeah. and it's just insane because you start to think is this real and I that person on American Idol who thinks I can sing and I can't and you go home and you have to like remind yourself of who you are there's that scene in um what is the movie Black Panther where um where his mom the queen is just like uh She's just like, remember who you are, show them who you are. There's a scene that gives me chills when she says mm -hmm. it. And um, and and you have to go remind yourself of who you are. So at that moment, I just had to fight. I had to be like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I have to fight. I have to like not let this be the peak of my career. I have to go and reinvent myself and show the world that I have something to offer. And I'm not gonna run home to Texas with my tail between my legs and think that Simon Cowell knows the, the extent of what my career can be and i'm really glad that i fought and that i that i am now i'm no longer known as todrick from american idol which i thought right. was going to be like the, the my existence that i was yeah. assuming was on american idol and very rarely do i even talk about it because it was such a blip in in time yeah i i love that you kind of pulled the curtain back a little bit i think obviously as audiences, we only see what's given to us and what's produced. And it's always interesting to see what happens behind the scenes, like what really happens when you are a contestant. I wish I could say that I, I got cut the first round when I auditioned years ago. <laughs> so it's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was way, I don't even know when, when it was, it was in Orlando like 10 or 12 years ago. Um, but I always had a feeling, right? The, the, what really happens behind the scenes and what's given to audiences. But what I, what I'm most impressed is how folks are able to take those experiences and use those as launch pads for something bigger and better. I hope people who don't make it that far and learn something about themselves and know that your worth isn't defined by a judge or votes that may or may not be legit, whatever it is, it, you know, it, it's so much more than that. And, and this is actually a nice transition into what I believe to be a very exciting part of your career, um, which is your time on Broadway. I, I was a thespian, a fellow musical theater lover. Like the second I wake up, the birds are singing in my head. When I walk down a hallway, <laughs> it's, it's my runway. So I, I love musical theater. You've done a ton of shows. You've been on um, three or four shows, I think, at the very least, and and, and actually Broadway, which five. Oh my god! <laughs> so you've done a ton. I'd love to know which is your favorite. I know you've done um, Kinky Boots, and and then you've been on um, The Color Purple. Which was your favorite, or do you have one that I think, or that you think really affected you as an artist, or impacted you as an artist? Um, I think I'm really loving the fact that I can just be candid here because sometimes I get a little bit of like flack on the internet for uh, not repping my community, the black community and, and the way that some people see that I should. But my experience with blackness has just been different from a lot of people's. I didn't, I grew up in a very black community, but, um, but then I got moved to a school that was mostly all white and then introduced to theater and dance. And when I went to those dance classes in theater schools, I was the only black person there. And so it was just, I got to a point where the things that I loved were things that like my black friends weren't talking about, weren't interested mm -hmm. in, didn't want to talk about, weren't interested in getting to know about. And so, it, it was just, it was great. So um, so my point is when I went to go see The Color Purple for me and my experience, I just cried so much, mm -hmm. not because it 
It's just a beautiful story, but it was the first time I walked into a room and saw Black people singing their faces off, telling a story that only Black people could tell. So that changed my life in a way that I don't know any other Broadway experience could, but so that that would maybe be my answer. But when I got the role of Kinky Boots and it was my first starring role, I felt like the role of Lola was written for me. Fun fact, that musical opened on April 4th, which is my birthday. Oh. And it was a story about a young man whose dad wanted him to be a boxer, but he was a drag queen and he changed the lives and minds of all this, these really conservative, you know, honky tonk like uh white people that lived in northampton and london and worked as just shoes very simple you know muggles as they call them and and that story changed my life so to star in that show and to be it to be a story about somebody who in my mind is lgbtq plus like they never say that lola is gay but that he's a fabulous drag queen so yeah. it, it was just really awesome and my fans just like sold out the shows and were screaming it felt like a beyonce concert it was just such a great experience and daryl roth the producer of that show just treated me like the best i've ever been treated she was just an incredible producer and the whole experience from top to bottom from every usher every custodian that worked there every orchestra member every stage crew member the makeup the hair the wig team the the production team jerry mitchell the choreographers that experience was so incredible so i would say it's a kind of a tie between the color purple and kinky boots yeah that's incredible i would die to be in the audience of you performing on stage that would be oh that would yeah, be incredible. Hard, hard, it's gonna happen <laughs> i was gonna say i hope you're back on stage um one question that that i thought of uh, obviously you've done so much work on camera you've been in videos you've produced things uh, what would you say is the biggest difference as a performer being on stage live in front of an audience versus being in videos I will say that the thing that I'm the most proud of in my career is being in those five Broadway musicals. And I just think that Broadway performers are like the Olympic gold medalist of like of the entertainment industry because people, even people who work hard in LA, no shade to the actors and actresses that do movies and television and film, but there is something very difficult about singing, dancing, acting, fine tuning all three of those skills and performing it and executing it live on stage every night, eight shows a week, year after year after year. That takes a certain amount of discipline and stamina that I don't think a lot of people in this industry in LA have. Like the mm. fact that they'll cut or let me do it again and get the perfect no taste and they can live on forever is really cool. So I love doing that. I love being able to make videos and reach millions of people on social media. That has been incredible. But to stand on stage in front of a live audience and take them on a journey and they can't get on their phone, they can't go talk to their friends, they can't be distracted, they have to sit there and be invested in the story. Mm -hmm. It's just something that in 2021, people don't hardly do anymore. I definitely don't. I definitely don't watch anything without getting on my phone. So I love theater. I've There's been some boyfriends that didn't work out because they didn't want to go to the theater with me. Bye, bye, sorry. Girl, <laughs> it's it's just really important to me to be able to go in and like, and be invested in a story and to see true talent. Cause I just personally believe that like, we are dwindling down what it means to be a singer. A lot of the people who are famous today, they're people like them because they're minimalists and they, they, they're not vocalists. They couldn't sing live and they could never do a Broadway show there. It's not a requirement for you to be able to sing anymore, to be the most famous singer in the world. You know, like yeah. I think a lot of people have to dumb down their vocal ability to make it like more palatable for people who are not gifted to sing. And I just miss the days where Mariah Carey was singing emotions and singing whistle tones and you just shut up and listen to her because she has a special gift and you don't. She'd sell out Madison Square Garden wearing a questionable black long gown and everybody was here for it. She didn't have to change costumes a million times. She didn't have to dance because her gift was so incredible. And I just miss that so much. And I really want that to come back because there was a time when Aretha Franklin and all in Celine Dion and, you know, I think Beyonce has that thing. I think Michael Jackson had that thing that was so special that you went to go see him because out of the billions of people in the world, he was the one person that could do that thing. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take that much to be a star these days to the point where now the Gen Z's and even some millennials don't even know what a star is when they see it. They have mm -hmm. now, they think that these people, these rappers with fake names and fake asses is like the epitome of what it means to be a star. And while I love all of those men and women that do those things and, and I'm here for the, the, the cakes, I just wish that both existed because mm -hmm. I want 
kids that are growing up, the reason why we sing the way we do is because we had great examples of great vocalists. And I mean, shout out to the Ariana Grandes and Demi Lovato's of the world that are like really, really, and, and the Beyonce's and like that are holding it down for the real vocalists and the Taylor Swift's of the world that are like writing music that is meaningful and lyrics that are genius because not everybody's doing that. And I'm just happy that when Taylor Swift writes something, the industry, the Grammy awards, the, the, the kids that understand that she is an artist that is writing lyrical content that is genius, taking you on a journey, like not just writing, you know, you ain't gotta go to work, 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 not being the chorus of her song, which I love that song and it's a bop. It's <laughs> but that's not the content she's giving us. And I just, I love that. I, I think, I love that both exist, but I love listening to her songs and just feeling like I am going on an, an absolute journey. Like oh. when I listen to a Taylor Swift song, I feel mm. like I'm transported and there's, and the lyrics put me in a, a place, you know, I think that's because she started in country music and country music. I just have to shout out to them. Like they take you on a journey. That is like a full movie. You will go, you will listen to a, a song. There's a song called the, Don't Forget to Remember Me that Carrie Underwood came out with. And when I listen to that song, I cry by the end of it. It's three minutes long. And I feel mm -hmm. like on an, I watched an entire movie. It's like such a huge roller coaster. But um, yeah. I don't know. That's 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 me and my my spiel, and I hope I didn't say anything to offend anyone. Because, like I said, like I love that song. You gotta go. You can work from home. Yeah. It is tisha.com. Yeah. But I I, I, I just want to live in a world where both things exist, and people don't have to to dumb down their vocal ability or dumb down their writing so that they can compete with something that is really simple. Because I I think we gotta keep challenging the world to like listen to lyrics and to be okay with the fact that they can't sing a note because that person, you know, like is, has a talent and a gift. And I don't know, I, I just want to, I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of that because nothing makes me sadder than seeing someone who is talented be told that they have to dumb down their, their gift mm -hmm. so that people can, so that it won't be um, intimidating to yeah. We don't have that gift that 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 saddens me and I, mm. I i feel like i see that happening a lot of course don't do not dare apologize you just took me on a journey i love just like how you explored all facets of, of performance and artistry and i think it's beautiful because you give credit to those that are artists and are performers and entertainers but you don't lose sight of those that truly are vocalists or singers and what I think is beautiful is everything that you just explained. I think you, you go to a concert, you see someone performing live, you feel that magic. There are no words, right? When when yeah. you're in, in a live performance with someone who's truly honed in on their craft as a vocalist, there are no words to explain it. You just feel it. I felt that when I saw Celine Dion live. I, I felt that when I saw Taylor live. I mean, these are you're listing my queens, and I um, and I love that you just you went off in like the best way possible, respecting all forms of artistry, but not losing sight of what what you believe is at the heart of a lot of that, which I think is important. And you do that. I, I wanted to say for the record, like I have some songs that I like absolutely love, but the songs that have become popular are songs where I'm just not singing, speaking nails, her hips, heels, or mm -hmm. gem beats or low, or, you know, like those are the songs that people gravitate towards. And I find myself sometimes in the studio wanting to sing and wanting to talk about real things. Um, but then I will put out a song next on an album next to a song that is super meaningful to me. That's just like very basic and repetitive. And that's the song that does really well. So you're, you're conflicted in the studio. Do I write something that's like surface level and shallow that I know that people are going to listen to because it requires zero effort or energy to, to, mm -hmm. To come along on that journey or do i write something that's meaningful to me i have a song called color that i love a song called painting in the rain a song called play um those songs to me are my song home um a lot of the songs on my album straight out of oz and forbidden are my favorite songs i've ever written but they're not the ones that people remember you know and so i i, I know that there are a lot of artists that probably go into the studio and they face that same dilemma do i sing about things that are important for a, a small niche group of people who will appreciate it mm. or do i sing about going on a shopping spree which i feel people will like definitely be like oh that's fun i love to shop, <laughs> shop until i drop 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 <laughs> the the bop of the yeah. season you know like, and i don't know it just it's 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 a slippery slope and it's difficult and i and i can't be the only artist that feels this way you know of course of course no thank you for that i i appreciate that um 
Speaking of songs that you've written, speaking of mm -hmm. songs that, that you have, um, I, I'd love to start transitioning. Yes, I love that. I, I see that little heart heart. Heart. Thanks for this cool fan that you just gave me at Drag Fest. Anytime I see like a neon magenta, I think of you, Chadrick. I'm not even kidding. I, I, I'm not even embarrassed to share. The first time I saw you was like in 2015. I was at a friend's house. We're watching YouTube and you're four Beyonce video popped up and it was <laughs> mute. Like I didn't even hear your voice, Todrick. I just saw four of you, blonde hair, beautiful eyes, these magenta lines splitting up all of you. And I'm like this, let's listen to this. They're like, Ricardo, please. I'm like, just unmute it and let's listen to it. And, and the rest is history from there. But um, sorry, the, the fan just popped up. How, when I think of you, I think of themes that I think you've been so true to yourself. The fact that you can evolve as an artist over the years, but still have elements of who you are throughout it, I think, is important because it shows your authenticity as an artist. Um, and I think Femulin is a perfect example of how you've grown as an artist, but you still remain true to yourself. I definitely want to talk about that a little bit. Folks, if you have any questions, now is the time to get them in. I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about the album, but would love to hear what you all have to say. If yes, you have any questions for ask Todrick, questions, ask ask questions. Ask questions. Yes, because we're going to keep this conversation going after this is done. I already told Todrick we're getting drinks when I go back to L.A., so I'm good. I've got more than enough time. <laughs> um, but if y'all want to pop in your questions, that'd be great. Um, but let's talk about this album. I mean, phenomenal. Okay. It's, it's a masterpiece. Um, I, I've been listening to it nonstop. Fun fact, I was listening to it yesterday, and I didn't realize that I accidentally had the playback speed at 1.5, because sometimes I'll speed through videos. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so fast. Like, I'm trying to dance to it, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like losing my breath. Um, so make sure that your playback speed is at the right speed. The tempo is perfect. Um, but talk to me about the, what was the inception? What was, what was the moment where you're like, this is what I want to create. This is what I want to do. Well, after nails their hips heels, I feel like a lot of people gravitated towards that. It was the first time I had done something that was kind of androgynous. Like normally if I had heels on, I would also have makeup and a wig on, but I was like, you know what? I think I'm just going to be boy Todrick. Uh-huh but then have heels on. And I did that and people really gravitated towards it. And I started realizing when I was getting the comments that that was giving a lot of people so much confidence to go out and just really be themselves and like not have to conform to what society says is men's or women. And mm -hmm. I was hanging out with this stylist uh, and he had like a hashtag Tom girl on, mm -hmm. on the pictures and I was like what's a tom girl he's like well you know down south when they call somebody a tomboy because the girl likes to play sports whatever I call myself a tom girl because I'm a boy that likes to like do things that people consider to be feminine and I loved that and so I was like how can I make my own version so I don't have to steal that concept but where I can be inspired by that concept mm -hmm. and um and so I came up with the concept femulin and I just loved it and um I wanted to write things that were specific to me I have a song called both where I talk about embracing my masculine and feminine side um, because I think right now even we, we as the gay community have been so judged and so put into a box but then when you get into the gay community we are also separating each other and I, I definitely felt like dating wise the more I got into there was a guy that I was like just like head over heels for that I met uh, like a couple of years ago and I was like I'm gonna marry him gonna mm -hmm. marry him and he had told a couple of people in his cast, I think he's so high, like I would definitely want to like date him or whatever. And then somewhere along the line, I feel like he went and Googled my videos or you know, whatever and saw that I was like doing drag and whatever. And we went out to eat. And he one of the questions he asked me like early in the conversation was like, When did you start doing drag? And I was like, Oh my gosh, a couple of years ago, you should, you should do it. And um, and it just he was just very off put by it. And I started realizing that the more I did these things, the more people were like unattracted, not interested. They'd be like, I love to watch it, but you're not somebody that I would want to date. And I had two choices at that point to either stop being true to myself because I actually like putting on heels and playing dress up and doing those things or to pretend to be more masculine than I was. And to me, that was like almost a form of like going back in the closet and every guy I've dated, no matter how masculine they are, when once you get to know them, there's a moment where they want to let their hair down and pretend to be Madonna, Cher, Beyonce, Lady Gaga, whatever. We all have that in us. We've all been inspired by these divas, but there's this stigma in the community that makes us want to be as masculine as possible because a lot of gay men want the closest thing they can get to a straight guy if not trying to get a straight guy in fact for themselves and so 
I just was like, I don't want to do that. I want to write an album that embraces this and celebrates it because it, it, for me to go backwards now would not be true to myself. Mm. And I don't really want to date somebody who's not forward thinking enough to think like, I don't have to date somebody who's wearing basketball shorts and drives a truck and plays video games and watches football or whatever. That's not actually like what I want to be with. I want to be with somebody who's fun. Who, like, it, I don't know, uh, not that those people aren't fun, but I'm no longer <laughs> and trying to pretend that I'm more masculine than I am so that I can get a guy to like me for the wrong reasons. I'm yeah. more dating somebody um, that is, that's forward thinking and who is, um, you know, whatever. So that's why I wrote Femulin because I felt like it was important in a love letter to people who are in this community who need to hear music about it being okay and get permission to embrace both of those sides. And that's kind of the general through line anthem of what Femulin represents. Mm. Thank you for that. Well, I think I speak for a lot of us when I say I'm glad that that didn't work out with that guy because <laughs> hopefully you're you're still looking for the right one that appreciates you for who you are. And and I love the message of, you know, your worth doesn't come from how someone else views you, it's who you are. Now, Femulin is a, is a very personal album, right? Because this is your relationship with, with, with music, with identity, with so many things. But what's interesting is that you both directly and indirectly hit a lot on identity, right? We're talking. Right gender expression, sexual orientation, um, and something that's beautiful when we were talking about Broadway, you talked about um, black community and how in the black community maybe um, you didn't feel as accepted for your elements of, of Broadway, of singing. And I, I think the the concept of intersectionality is really interesting, right? As a, as a fellow queer person of color, feeling like sometimes my people of color community doesn't truly, they may accept, they don't embrace my LGBTQIA plus identity. And yeah. the same, we both know in the gay community, right? There are levels of privilege there and and then and, and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. So uh, do you feel like it was intentional for you to add these messages um, of intersectionality, gender expression, sexual orientation into your album? Or was it more just like personal, your experience? Absolutely. I, I wanted to talk about things that were real, but put it to like a, a dance beat so that I could... Mm touch on things, but it, rather than hit people over the head with like, this is the lesson that I want you to learn. I more wanted them to like, feel confident with it. I definitely took a, t a page out of Lizzo's book because all everything that she does makes you feel confident, but there are strong messages of loving yourself and um, body uh, image issues and confidence. And um, so she touches on all those things without making it like a, you know, Christina Aguilera, you are beautiful type of song, which is, is great. But I like the way that she does it in a way that makes you feel confident and like you want to strut mm. through your room. So I tried to take that concept and put it into my own music. I love that. I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but folks who've reached the level of, of popularity or fame, there's often a lot of pressure for you to be the voice of a cause or politics or something. And, you know, I know there's a lot of folks that feel, look, you're up there, you have a responsibility to do this. And what I think is beautiful when artists say, look, I care about these things and I'm going to find my own creative way to speak on this and to shed light on this. And through my own experience in art, you are using your voice and your privilege, you know, to to let people know what it's about. People are dancing to it, but I think we're also listening to the message and thinking, yeah, this 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 is important and it matters. So yeah. um, I know we have a few questions from the audience. We'll go ahead and pop Yay! some of them up. Yes. Um, so if we just wanna pop up um, some of the questions that are, uh, yep. All right, so first from Rishi, we have, what is next for Todrick? What's something you aspire to do by 2030? All right, so you yeah, got 2030. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, I would say that I would love my goal in life, you know, accomplishment of wise is to EGOT to get an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony. And I would love to get all of those things for things that I wrote or starred in. Um, and so um, so I, I really want to write a musical. I want to write books, which has nothing to do with my EGOT, but I would love to create a TV show. I would love to um, create movies and movie musicals. And I definitely want to be a person that has elements of uh, queer representation in every single thing that I create, even though I know that sometimes that's not for mainstream media, but I think that it's really important for someone to do that. And I would love to be that person that breaks barriers and does things that are out of the box to be game changing um, for our community. Love that. Well, we're all supporting you in that goal. I think that's super exciting. You're going to have so many bodies of work. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> um, all right. We have another question coming in. This one is from Quentin. What songs, albums are you playing on repeat lately? 
Uh, I listen to Chloe and Hallie religiously. Uh, the the newest album by Jasmine Sullivan, I listen to on repeat. Um, I kind of am a creature of habit. I listen to like Hunter Hayes, like religiously. I listen to his music all the time. Um, but I would say that the albums that right now I'm listening to would be Chloe and Hallie and Jasmine Sullivan. Love that. Phenomenal vocal. Speaking of vocalists, my goodness, talk about raw talent. Like, who? Mm -hmm. I love that. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right, we have another question coming up. Lauren, I'm a singer myself and I've always wondered how Broadway performers keep their bodies and their voices healthy to be able to do eight shows a week. Oh my gosh, Lauren, it is the most <laughs> thing in the world, but I think that's why I, I talk so much about the, um, the discipline it takes to be on Broadway because those artists, like when I was on, in color uh, in Kinky Boots, I had to not speak from midnight until 12. And if I didn't have a show till the evening, I didn't talk until 2 p.m. I drank lots of water. I slept with a steamer every night, but a lot of people on Broadway have to live their entire life, even when they're not on stage, to be prepared to do what it is that they do on stage. They don't take phone calls, they don't vocal rest all the time. They're always, and um, you know, like, getting massages and going to like therapy for their bodies to be able to do those shows every single day and still taking classes to fine tune their craft, still taking voice lessons to strengthen their, their, their skill. It's, it's really, really, really difficult. Um, but people do it and they, um, they make a lot of sacrifices. That's why I just have so much respect for everybody who has ever been in a Broadway show. Definitely. Thank you so much for that. And it's funny. I, I, I always wonder if I can add a little follow-up question, Todrick. When I was reading your bio, we talked about the double threats and the triple threats, and you've got so many areas of expertise and passion. I think that's exciting. Um, there's this video on on YouTube. It's a TED Talk, and I don't know the actual title, but it's called The Multipotential Light. And it's like, there's so many areas that you're good at it, that you're passionate about. It's tough to balance them. So I'd be curious, how do you balance? Do you prioritize being a singer or a choreographer or a producer? Or, or a rapper, or, or are they on the same level? How do you go about prioritizing those? I don't really prioritize them, and perhaps I should, because sometimes I feel like I'm running in circles, being like, do this, do this, this. And I think a lot of people who become super successful masters of their craft, like focus specifically on that one thing 100% of the time. But I love to dance, and I love to sing, and I love to act, I love to create, I love to produce, I love to choreograph, I love to design, I love to write, and I love all those things equally. So it's really difficult for me to choose what things I do um, but I'm I, I'm trying to get better about like figuring out what it is I want to do to get what to get where I want accomplishment wise so that I can feel like I can lay back and be like I did everything that I wanted to do I created Broadway shows I wrote movies I wrote novels I wrote I wrote songs that were Grammy award winning songs that whatever I I, I want to start fine-tuning that but I, I don't I and one of those people I'm definitely in Meryl Streep talks about having imposter syndrome where she can't believe that she's like in the room or that people, you know, give her the awards that she's gotten or whatever. And I definitely have that. I, I grew up with nothing. So when people give me an opportunity, I do it. And right now we're in a time and age where it's not cool to be like, put me in coach, like to try so hard, but I don't know how to give less than a hundred percent. I don't, I don't know how to do that. So when I do something, if I'm a part of it, you're going to know, you're like, Oh no, one else would be this full out or this extra and I used to apologize for that but now I'm like no like it's kind of cool when you're in shows and stuff some people are like yeah I'm really tired I don't want to be here but it's a check and as long as that check clears and I don't really say things like that because I'm not really there for the check and I'm not really like I'm I'm very every time I'm on set I'm excited to be there I might be exhausted that day because I haven't slept but I'm so excited to be there and be on stage and to get the opportunity. So um, I'm kind of like right now teaching myself how to not apologize for being still so excited about performing because mm. this is what I love to do. And if I didn't love it, I wouldn't be doing it, you know? Oh, I love that. You're like epitomizing that one swan metaphor where it's like a billion things are going on behind the scenes and you're probably making decisions and having to do so much, but um, the finished product, I think, is beautiful, right? It's just you as an artist and an entertainer doing what you love, and it shows. So I love that. Thank you for the question. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions from the audience. Of course, now they're all coming in. They're like, hold up. I want a second to talk to Todd Drake. Oh all good, folks. We'll get through them. All right, we have Trisha. I'm a Swifty. Can you speak on your relationship with Taylor, your collaboration with her music video, Need to Calm Down? Um, so 
I, I always just like sing Taylor's praises because she's just the sweetest person in the world. And I, I was nervous when we started to get closer because I'm like, I don't want to see anything about her that will make me not like her because I just like loved her so much. And um, and I was such a huge fan of, of Taylor before I became her friend. And when I became friends with her, it made me even more of a fan of her because she's just so kind and the way she treats people is just... I don't know. I've just I've never seen someone go above and beyond like the the things that she does to like be just just be so sweet to people. And a lot of people would do those things and then tweet about it so that people know that they did it. And she just has no desire to go promote the nice things that she's doing for people. If people find out, then cool. But she's done so many nice things for me that I've never spoken about just because. I was like, I think I've said enough, but like if people knew the nice things that she does for people and also her parents, yeah, I think oftentimes it's like you get to meet someone's parents and you're like, that's why you are that way. Like to meet Andrea and Scott and to meet Tree, her publicist and Erica, uh, like, and her brother. I mean, they're just, everybody in the family is just so kind and, and unbelievably welcoming while being, you know, also real. It doesn't feel fake. If there's something real that needs to be discussed or something serious, they'll let you know, but it's just, it's just done in a way that, that, everybody around her is so respectful and it's always the same people that have been there for years. And I think that's a huge testament to what, how someone is to work with because people wouldn't be sticking around them if they weren't great people to work with, but she's just incredible. So anybody who's as Swifty, I'm always like, yes, I love that you support her because she deserves it. She works really, really hard and she sits down, she takes her music so seriously. When she's in a room with that guitar, it's just her and in that room writing and pouring her soul out, which can be so vulnerable. And she does it over and over and over again. And I think that's why her music has stood the test of time. There, it, It's really difficult to stay as relevant as Taylor Swift has stayed mm. in the industry, but she never stops growing. She never stops challenging herself to evolve. And you see that in her writing. And um, I think that's why people fall in love with her and doing You Need to Calm Down was just so incredible. She, she was also so chill on the set of that. <laughs> I was like, what are you going to wear? And she's like, I don't know. If you want to wear that, I'll just wear something different. <laughs> no one would do that if they were starring in a video. Like what I was wearing was a robe that was like in her room. And I was like, I love that. And she was like, cool, wear it. And I was like, yeah. well, what do you wear? I'll wear something else. I just, I can't believe how surprisingly chill she is. She's just like, yeah. it'll work out. If you love it that much, like, then I'll just do something else. I just, I think that, I don't know, to, to be that humble at that stage is, is really cool and Beyonce is the same way. I had the chance to work with Beyonce and it's just when you meet people like that, when you meet Oprah, when you meet Queen Latifah, when you meet these people who are so incredibly kind, you're just like, that's why you are where you are. Yeah. That's, why, that's why you made it. And Beyonce is the sweetest Southern belle that you have ever met in your entire life. And the way she goes out of her way to make people feel welcome and doesn't let people be referred to as extras on her videos and stuff. I just think those little things are the attention, the details, the kind gestures that you don't have to do at that level. But if you do them, there are things that make people want to root for you, want to keep coming back and working for you, want to keep supporting you. Um, those are things that Beyonce and Taylor and Queen Latifah. And who was the other person that I mentioned that was so kind? Oprah, uh, those people, they do those things and, and every and Will Smith, those type of people do things that are just so incredibly kind that, you know, like it, it's just hard for you not to love them, you know? Of course. What I think is great is I think a lot of us have this image of artists and, and folks who, you know, are on screen. And when you hear someone who actually knows that person and validates that, it's cool because it's like, wow, like epitome of authenticity. And I mean, you and Taylor's relationship is like friend friendship goals. I, I don't I know I don't speak just for myself, but I was a fan of hers and a fan of yours. And when we saw that come together. It's like, oh, that's so perfect. And it makes sense. And I love it. So thank you for shedding light on your relationship with some of those folks. I think we have uh, maybe one more question that we can do from the audience. I'm not willing to let go of you yet, Todrick. I hope you can. Okay, okay. Maybe, I'll one more. <laughs> maybe we can do two. Anything you want. Um, all right. So we're throwing a little corporate spin. Is there anything that you wish for Google or other companies um, to do in order to improve LGBTQ plus lives? I think this, I think what Google is doing right now in this moment, highlighting and, and putting a spotlight on 
to queer people having this interview and not during the month of June, because a lot of people turn things around in June and they're like, June, 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 let's do something gay for June. But that doesn't necessarily like, I think that gay people are here 365 days of the year. And I would love to get to a place where people as a part of the LGBTQ plus community didn't feel like we had to accept 8 billion jobs in June and store up for the winter because it's not going to come around to the next year. Mm. So kudos to Google for always being on the forefront of LGBTQ plus rights and for giving us opportunities to express ourselves and to share our stories 365 days of the year. That would be what I would, that would be my hope for the future mm. for major corporations like this. I love that. I think that's a great charge and call to action. I know there's folks working behind the scenes to make that happen. We've got a long way to go. We are not where we need to be, not just at Google, not just in tech, across a ton of industries. And I'm excited and hopeful um, for where we're going and, and where we need to be. So thank you for that. Um, at last thing, Todrick, is there anything you'd like to say to the audience? Uh, obviously, you want folks to buy the album, to check out the music videos, to go on tour. Anything else you want to leave? Uh, yeah, I'm going on tour next year, March through May, and I've had so much time to work on it. So the tickets are available at todrickhall.com. Get your tickets, come out and support. You'll have a great time. Listen to the music first if you're underage, because there are curse words there. But I think the overwhelming message of positivity and inclusivity and embracing who you are is a lot more um, loud and proud than the, the the choice words that are in the show. So I think it's a great time and I hope to see a lot of you there at the tour and I hope to meet you very soon, Ricardo. Yes, that's happening. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, folks. That wraps up our talk today. I want to thank all of our audience members who joined us, who had amazing questions for Todrick. And of course, thank you, Todrick, not only for your time today, but for entertaining us by doing what you love, for allowing us to join you on the ride. Um, I mean it when I say that you allow people to see themselves on TV and on stage. You do so boldly and proudly and unapologetically. And I think through your authenticity and following your dreams, you open doors for so many people and you impact so many lives. So please, for me and for everyone that's watching and folks that aren't even on the call, keep doing what you're doing because we love it. This has been an incredible treat for me. Um, and I definitely got to hit you up when I'm in LA. So I hope to have you back yeah. on the show or in person. <laughs> okay, done deal, Ricardo. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed day. Bye.